All right, folks, we're going to kick off um, our next um, segment. So part of today's content was to sort of focus not simply on stuff that we rarely see, but to focus on what we see every day. Um, and, um, and also how to better connect not just with our families, but with our specialists uh, around models of sharing the same message and collaborative care and knowing what to manage in your practice and what to refer early or late or those sorts of things. So next up, we're going to be talking about a lot of the musculoskeletal concerns that we see day in and day out in primary care practice. And I'm um, thrilled to introduce Dr. Kayor Desai who is part of our orthopedics and sports medicine program at, oh yeah, Children's National. Dr. Desai. All right, thanks for having me, everybody. For those of you that have attended a previous talk that I've given at the PHN before, sorry you have to hear me again. For those of you that have never heard my voice, 30 minutes later, you're gonna be kind of wishing I'm done anyway. So let's get started, maybe. All right, so today we're going to be talking about back pain and knee pain, and I kind of wanted to start with the board question. So I'm coming out guns ablazing here. Take a second here, think, read this topic over. Um, this topic came to mind because, as a former family doc, I always got a lot of questions on. Well, number one, I don't know what I'm seeing. Number two, I don't know what to do about it, and so that's how this topic came to be. So my guess is most of you are going to be here. My goal is in the next 30 minutes to get you all up to here. So wish me luck, here we go. So to set some stage and some context here, epidemiology, right? Back pain and knee pain are extremely common complaints that you all see regularly in your offices. Knee pain tends to be kind of among all joints, probably the most leading cause of outpatient referrals and, and evaluations and visits that you all see. Back pain, we tend to see increasing numbers of in pediatrics over the last several years, especially. However, data on pediatric specific populations tends to be a little limited in terms of when we just look at total numbers of visits annually. We see them both in athlete and non-athlete populations. And so your management concerns and questions tend to always be very variable in those situations. And so specifically looking at back pain, you know, we see starting at, you know, even younger ages, right? We'll see back pain in kind of that seven year to 10 year range. And, you know, prevalence of around 5% or so, then a sharp inflection as kids start to become more active, get a little older, start gets, getting closer towards skeletal maturity. And then we really see kind of in the older adolescent population that we're getting into the teens and 20%. Uh, um, so one kind of takeaway from this is back pain in young, young, young kids is rare. And especially orthopedic back pain tends to be even rarer in that population. So if you've got a seven-year-old you're seeing for back pain, maybe musculoskeletal, but also consider non-musculoskeletal etiologies for all those patients. Most commonly, a lot of it tends to be referred from other viscera. So think constipation, abdominal pain, et cetera, things like that. When you get to the older ages, then you want to think about, well, all the other more common types of back pains that we see, musculoskeletal, orthopedic type stuff that we're going to talk about today heavily. As we get into your teens, your college, you know, college kids coming back from school with back pain, we know that prevalence tends to increase annually and up to a point that, you know, in adult populations, we have a lifetime prevalence of about 75%. So it's common, you're going to see it regularly. And so here's some strategies on how to manage it. So starting off with three vignettes here. So the first vignette, we've got a 13 year old who comes to see you with a chief complaint of back pain. They have, they've been having lumbar back pain after doing deadlifts and lifting in the, the weight room. Their pain got better, they went back to athletics. Now they're coming to see you because they're having pain when they rotate, when they bend, and when they extend. Second case, you have a 17 year old who comes to you with a chief complaint of shoulder pain. When you talk to them, they actually tell you, well, it's more actually in my upper back between my scapula. It used to be intermittent, now it's getting worse, and now it's pretty constant to the point that I can't do my activity. Third case, seven year old comes to you with back pain, no known medical history, otherwise healthy. Pain started about four weeks ago. It's been worsening in intensity. Now reaches a 10 out of 10. Wakes them up in the middle of the night. 
starting to get febrile, refusing PO, not really being touched by over-the-counter analgesics, Tylenol and ibuprofen. So it's a lot of words I just said right there. Hang on, we're gonna walk through how you differentiate these cases, what you do to manage them, and what we can what we can do in the office and what you should refer out. So first, take a breath. Identify what part of the anatomy are you talking about? Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral anatomy. So that just helps you set the stage, like what should I even be concerned about and what is the possibility? Then you wanna talk about, is it more midline and spinal or is it more paraspinal and kind of off to either of the sides or some of the other soft tissue structures in the area? Once you go from there, right? So thinking about now going back to anatomy here. So seven cer cervical vertebra, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and then you've got your sacral vertebra. When we do palpation, right, you're pushing on this part of the spine here, the spinous process. And so that tells you that's kind of more midline. And then you've got all the surrounding anatomic structures around it. So now you've got a sense on, all right, I have a person here with back pain. They've come to me and we've determined it's this part of the spine. Gotten a little bit more sense. Is it midline, not midline, soft tissue? Now, what are some of the things I need to be worried about that should get my antennas up? So certainly if they come to you with a very high risk traumatic mechanism, a major fall, a sudden, you know, big injury at a sporting event, severe midline tenderness, any neurologic findings or associated findings, any constitutional symptoms, fevers, night sweats, weight changes, et cetera, any nocturnal pain, anorexia, PO intolerance, and then pain unresponsive to other conservative measures, analgesics, rest, activity modification, et cetera. In general, these are all going to be very rare. So I put these words up here so that you're aware of them, so that you kind of heard them, so that when you see something, there's a little radar that goes off in the back of your brain. But 99% of what you see is not going to fall into this category. So once you've gotten your basic history, here's how I kind of do a, a, a spinal exam. So walk them, check how they're standing, how, what their pelvic tilt looks like, how much core engagement they have as they move. So are they worsening their tilt? Are they lordotic? Are they kyphotic? Cervical wise, you can do a cervical range of motion. You'll do a couple special tests, thoracic stuff, lumbar. Um, we'll talk about these special tests under the lumbar section in a second here. Palpations, you want to go midline, which is going to be over those spinous processes that we were just talking about. And then you can actually feel two bony bumps off to the side. Those are going to be your transverse processes. And then off to the sides from those, you've got your paraspinals. In a lumbar patient, I always encourage you to do a hip exam at the same time that you're doing a lumbar exam, just basic range of motion, because there's a lot of overlap and cross referral between back pain and hip pain. And then because the spine is close to all these structures, always doing a basic neuro exam, reflexes, sensory testing over those dermatomes and strength testing. So ranges of motion, cervical spine, you can do flexion, extension, lateral bend, so touch your ear to your shoulder and then rotation. Lumbar spine, you can flex at the spine, so bend forward, touch your toes, extend, bend backwards, lateral bend, again, bend sideways, and then rotation, rotate and look through. And so those are all the ranges of motion that you can try to put your, your, your patients through, and then that'll just give you a sense on where they're limited, what they're reporting for pain. When we talk about pelvic tilt, we're looking, most patients you're going to see are going to fall under this right-hand side category. And so anterior pelvic tilt, right? What I want to point out here is, can you see my mouse? No. Um, is there a laser? Also no. All right, there we go. So lap, anterior pelvic tilt, right? You're going to see that there's this very large curve in through here. And the pelvis is not sitting level to the point that the anterior pelvis has now kind of fallen downward. So this exaggerates kind of the curve posteriorly versus a more neutral tilt. The hips are going to be a little bit more aligned this way. And then a posterior pelvic tilt where the actual spine or the hips are kind of tilted downward. So all of this is just another measure of core engagement and core strength. And it's just something else that can help you kind of differentiate what you should or should not be worried about and how other thing, how you can manage these. So some other special tests for lumbar back pain specifically, right? To look for radicular symptoms. On the left-hand side here, we've got the straight leg raise. So you have your patient lay down supine on the table. You passively lift their leg up and you try and keep the knee straight as you do so. They'll experience some sensation in the hamstring because you're stretching the hamstring, but you should also be able to elicit any radicular symptoms. So are they having pain deep to, or distal to the hamstring down towards the toes and the feet? 
One other way you can exacerbate this is you can then take the foot and you can actually forcibly dorsiflex the foot. So point the toes further towards their head. And that will then continue to pull more tension onto that sciatic nerve and those lower lumbar foramina. On the right-hand side here, this is called Stork's test. So we did lumbar extension. This is just a one-legged version of that. And the etiology of this is that this is going to essentially stress one part of the spine compared to the other side of the spine. So this may help you determine, are they having more right-sided lumbar back pain, left-sided lumbar back pain? And then a true positive would be concerning for more of a central process on the, the transverse processes of the spine or the PARS. So when I talk about hip testing, there's hip ranges of motion, right? That's just your reflection, extension, log roll, but then a couple special tests here. So on the left-hand side, you have Faber. So you're having the patient lay, again, supine. You take their knee and you cross the ankle onto the contralateral knee. You push down on the knee and the opposite hip. And so in doing so, you're separating the hip out. If this elicits pain in the hip, but also in the back, you may think, is this more of a hip or an SI joint issue? On the right-hand side, you have a test called Fader's test. So this is where you flex their hip, and then you start to internally rotate it as you're pushing it across their body. And so this is going to compress that hip joint. And if this is very positive and painful and recreates their symptoms, then you're wondering, is this more of an intraarticular hip pathology and less of a back pathology? So you've done your tests. You've done your history. Now, in terms of a differential, this is a lot of words on this slide, right? This, these are the things that, at least being vaguely familiar, will kind of help you differentiate what path you want to take them down. Structural issues, meaning fractures, mechanical back pain, spondylolysis and spondylolisthesis, which I get lots of questions about, we'll cover. Discopathy, so discogenic back pain, herniations, her degenerative back, uh, degenerative discs, scapular issues, fascial trigger points, cauda equina syndrome, arthritis of the back, oncologic issues, infectious issues, rheumatologic and referred pain. So... There's a lot of possible etiologies. Again, if you've got somebody who's cleared your history, who's got a generally not very re concerning exam, hasn't told you any of those major red flag symptoms, you're most likely looking at somebody who's just got nonspecific or mechanical back pain. So this is a very busy table, but I put this up here so that you all can have an easy reference. So, well, you're welcome to take a photo of it as a kind of reference point, but the top column or the top row rather is going to be the one that really is going to be the bulk of what you are seeing in your practice. And so nonspecific mechanical back pain may not have an etiology, may have just gotten worse with activity, worse with time, most likely going to be musculoskeletal, very strongly related to poor core strength, poor pelvic strength, poor lumbar support, often worsened with posture, sitting, physical activity. If you do get imaging, and we'll talk about that in a minute, probably not going to see anything very concerning. Treatment that you all can initiate for this, relative rest, which we'll talk about what that means, continuing activity, so not saying, all right, you have back pain, don't move, and then physical therapy, and we'll talk about what physical therapy should be addressing. You've done all of this. When do you say, all right, I'm kind of tried the things that I know how to do. When do they need to be seen onward if this is what we're dealing with? Obviously, if there's anything urgent you see in any of these cases, refer them onward. But otherwise, if they're not improving after physical therapy. Spondylolysis, I get a lot of questions about these next three. So I kind of lumped them on this table, even though they aren't as common, just because I think they're ones that a lot of people are you know, confused about or have questions about or hear about, but don't know what to do about next. So spondylolysis is going to be a stress injury of the posterior spinal elements at the PARS. Typically, it's going to be in your athlete populations, people who do a lot of extension activity, a lot of rotation activity, dancers, gymnasts, soccer players, tennis players, volleyball players. Um, these ones, an x-ray will may or may not be diagnostic, an MRI will be diagnostic. These ones get rested, and I would recommend you refer them onward for more definitive management afterward, um, because once you see this type of spinal uh, T2 edema in their MRI, that's a pretty good sign that they've got a stress reaction that needs to be managed and kind of controlled before they go back to activity. Otherwise, it can worsen to a true fracture. Spondylolisthesis, or slippage of the two vertebrae, so one level on top of the other, one level slips, and we'll, we'll show you some pictures of those. This is going to be diffuse lumbar back pain, probably nonspecific, but you may or may not see some ridiculous symptoms depending on the degree of slippage. Often pain with extension, postures, and stiffness as well. These ones, you can try some physical therapy and some rest. But then you can also simultaneously, when you've started that treatment and initiated, refer them onward because if they're having some of these more significant symptoms, 
they may need to talk about other management strategies in addition to the physical therapy. Discopathy, so this is another common question I get in office a lot is, doc, do you think this could be my disc? Herniated discs, degenerative discs, annular fissures and bulges, um, all kind of fall into this same category. And so things that we're really looking at here, right? Pathologies of disc diseases are gonna have different presentations and different symptoms depending on what level, depending on what the degree is of the slippage. They may come with acute pain, right? I did an activity and my back suddenly caused me severe pain and I have radicular symptoms. Or they may have more specific, more concerning symptoms and on top of that. So relative rest, physical therapy for these ones. And then if not improving, always a good one to refer on. So why do we get back pain? We see sedentary lifestyles, high screen time and obesity with our less active population that have high prevalence. And then on the, oh, can't go backwards. On the other side of the curve, we see very active people. Scoliosis is another common etiology. So back pain may or may not be related to scoliosis, but often you're going to screen for this in office. So if they're having scoliosis and you see the asymmetry, then they may or may not benefit from physical therapy, plus then also orthopedics for some manage or for some imaging and to talk about when they should be getting more treatment. The Adams forward bend test, which you're all pretty familiar with here, you do them in your office regularly. On the left-hand side, that's a normal. On the middle picture, that's a asymmetry. And then on the right-hand side, that's a standing positive scoliosis, uh, you know, just visual inspection. So PCP initiated treatment for most etiologies of back pain, continue physical activity. So you can still walk, you can still do certain physical activity. And then in physical therapy, start on core strengthening, lumbar pelvic stabilizers, and then other therapies that may be indicated, manual therapy, dry needling, Graston, treat with NSAIDs, Tylenol, Muscle relaxants have no benefit and actually may cause adverse effects. So for those of you that practice in acute care settings, probably shy away from things like your flexorils and your cyclobenzaprines. I get asked a lot, should I see a chiropractor? There is no data that supports that seeing a chiropractor is going to do anything for your back pain. Um, and in general, all the high quality studies that we see, number one, show no benefit. And number two, in clinical practice, I see that the best chiropractors are just doing physical therapy. So just send them to a physical therapist. Who should I hold out from activity? So certainly people who are having worsening pain with activity to the point that they can't move, if they've got any of the imaging findings that we talked about, limited range of motion, difficulty with functional tasks such as squatting and jumping, and then some of these diagnoses that we've talked about. So how do you order imaging and how do you manage some of these things? So if you have somebody who's got emergent symptoms, they go to the ER. If you have somebody who has some of these more urgent findings, but not somebody who's screaming at you like they've got a severe back. You can get x-rays if you have the ability to do so in between their visit, but also you can send them onward. That's definitely valid to do so because we have x-ray on-site everywhere. But most of your patients are going to be that bottom category. So get an x-ray first when you started seeing them. Recommended a standing AP and lateral full spine. If you're worried about spondylolysis, you can always get oblique films. And then if they're not getting better, you can get an MRI six weeks after you've done some physical therapy. So a few x-ray examples here. So these are some oblique films, and I want to point out where those two arrows are. So we're looking at the positive findings of PARS defects, so that little black line that kind of cuts across the PARS through there. Looking at the lumbar discs themselves, we're seeing um, that we see a little bulge right where these arrows are. In extension on the left-hand side, this is a cervical spondylolisthesis. So you can see that little slippage right there. And on the right-hand side, that's an anterolisthesis of L5 on S1 in the lumbar films on a lateral film. So those are just some things to look out for. Let's go back to our vignettes. So case A, back pain, came with extension and activity, spondylolysis, rest them, physical therapy, and return to play because it was confirmed on MRI. Case B, the shoulder pain ended up having a bunch of soft tissue type injuries, responded well to physical therapy, got back to activity. Case three, that younger kid with back pain, that was the one that stands out, right? That's the one that you send to the ER from clinic because they've got a lot of stuff going on that gives you concern. Found to have vertebral osteomyelitis, had to get admitted for IV antibiotics. We're gonna switch over in my remaining time and talk about knee pain. And so four vignettes here, one with months of intermittent knee pain, the second one with a twisting injury during football. The third one, a non-athlete doing TikTok dances, had a twisting injury and saw her kneecap move. And the fourth one, a 15-year-old with no specific injury but has recurrent swelling. So believe in the beads. Hold on. We're going to get through this. 
history and exam is going to be key for all of your knee findings. So date of injury, mechanism of injury, a pain history. So where is it? What makes it better? What makes it worse? Presence and absence of swelling versus an effusion. So swelling, probably more localized, firm, extra articular fluid. An effusion is going to be that big boggy knee. It's going to be diffusely enlarged, compressible and mobile fluid, intra-articular. If you see that, ask when did it begin? Immediately, within hours, within several days, intermittently. Do they have instability, which is giving out of the knee? Or are they having buckling where their knee hurts and then their knee gives out after that? Do they have mechanical symptoms, clicking, catching, locking, feeling something obstructing their motion? And how active are they currently? Big slide here, lots of words. Basically, a key physical exam is do inspection, check for an effusion, check for ranges of motion, strength test, and then all the special tests on the right-hand side that you've all seen and done before in residency and in your practices. So palpation-wise, I like to go systematically. I go down, then I go across the femoral condyles, across the joint line, and then across the tibial plateaus to the back of the knee, down the hamstring. And so that's how you kind of hit every structure systematically so that when you're palpating, you know, hey, this is the structure I'm on, and you do it kind of in a consistent uh, fashion every time. A knee effusion, that top picture, that left side of that top picture, that right knee, has a large effusion. To check for an effusion, you can hand on the thigh, hand on the calf, compress and squeeze together, and that's going to help that fluid kind of pop out. And that'll be a differentiating factor for you between an art uh, effusion and swelling. If you have POCUS capabilities in your office, great time to use it to verify your knee effusions. So these black stripes that you see right in through here are all going to be that knee effusion. So very easy to slap a probe on if you have one in your practice and in your office. Very easy to confirm it. That way you can show them, hey, this is something more serious going on. Let's talk about how we manage it. Patellar glide. So for that kid who did the TikTok dances, you're going to be able to see how much can I shift that kneecap sideways. So two quadrants, pretty normal. Two More than two quadrants, abnormal. ACL testing. I got lots of people who come and see me like, I'm not comfortable with my ACL testing. I don't know how to do a lock win. I do one every three weeks. Good news for you is if you can do an anterior drawer, probably just as good. And that's the one that you're probably a lot more comfortable with and more familiar with from your training and from your practices and requires less of having done a million of them. Meniscus testing. Three tests. So the top left test here is going to be your McMurray. So that's the prone test. The top right test is going to be your athletes. You lay them prone. You're going to push the knee in, twist. Bottom test is the Thessalys. You have them do a single leg squat and you twist back and forth. Knee anatomy here. So in the interest of time, I'm going to skip past that side and go to the high yield structures. So big things you got to know, a few major muscles, quads, hamstrings, um, patellar tendon, ligaments, ACL, PCL, MCL, LCL. And then you've got four major bones, femur, patella, tibia, fibula. So anatomically, the kneecap sits on top of a groove in the femur. The femur sits on top of the tibia. The tibia and the fibula share a joint space at the top. And then you've got this kind of uh, interosseous inter space in between those two bones. Muscular-wise, you have all these different attachments. So just being familiar with what exists in what part of the knee will help you kind of narrow down your differential and your diagnosis. So you've done your exam. You've done your history. You've got a sense on what's going on. And so anterior knee pain is going to be your most common etiologies of knee pain. You've got then IT band syndrome and instability, OCD lesions, ligamentous injuries and meniscus pathology, and then some other less common stuff. So th things that should be more urgently sent out. Emergency visits for things you're concerned about, septic joints and overlying cellulitis, open fractures, compartment syndromes, no distal pulses and lo loss of distal control, true joint dislocations, and then orthopedic sports medicine evaluation. If anybody's got an effusion, obviously if they've got a fracture, if you see an OCD lesion, which we'll talk about on x-ray, patellar tendon pathology and ruptures require urgent follow-up, any meniscus or ligamentous concern, and then certainly people who are not improving. But that top section is going to be very rare. That bottom section is going to be a very specific subset of your population. This is what you're going to see most of. So again, Four very common diagnoses that are going to pop into your office regularly. Patellofemoral syndrome, atraumatic anterior knee pain, often with repetitive flexion, extension, walking, running, sitting. May or may not have tenderness across different parts of the knee. SLJ syndrome is going to be at the inferior patellar pole in your younger preteen population and kind of older youth population. 
Patellar tendonitis can happen at many different ages, and it's going to be most commonly at the proximal patellar tendon. And then osgood schlatter is going to be at that tibial tubercle in kind of that adolescent age range. So all of these, there's lots that you can start for treatment. But first round treatment is going to be some physical therapy. And so that's working on hip strength, core strength, quadricep strength, and control in terms of squats and functional stuff. For those SLJ syndrome, tendonitis, and osgood schlatter patellar tendon straps can be effective. For patellofemoral syndrome, consider taping. So that's that bottom right-hand picture. And if those are all helpful, great. You've saved that patient a bunch of other time. They've gotten back to activity. For activity modification, while they're in physical therapy, they're allowed to do stuff and do physical activity in sports, but modify it. So reduce things that put lots of impact in running, reduce knee extension loading, reduce minutes of playing if they're having pain after a certain amount of time, reduce squats and lunges. And then certainly if you see any of the bottom stuff, severe pain, antalgia, inability to use the leg normally, that's when you would hold them out. Acute knee injuries, so another PCP-initiated treatment that you can all start. Somebody sees you, they've got a big old swollen knee, they had an acute injury. Things that you can start doing. Top picture here is going to be some um, hip, some, some knee flexion stuff. Top right picture here is going to be quad sets, pushing the quad down, straight leg raises, and then knee extensions up through here. And so those are range of motion exercises you can start when you see them, even if you're sending them on for further evaluation. We kind of talked about all of this slide already. And then x-ray interpretation. So four standard views, AP, lateral, sunrise, and tunnel. Specify these in your orders because otherwise the facility does other stuff. And this is going to help you evaluate many other structures. So a couple x-rays here just to kind of round things up. This left-hand picture here, we see a big swollen knee. We see separation of the patella. On the right-hand side, that's not a knee. That's a hip. So remember, I said check the hips when you check the knees because every so often you're going to see a skiffy. So that's what this right-hand picture is. Both of these are the same patient. So this is an acute knee injury who comes to you with a tibial tubercle or a tibial spine avulsion. And so that's another thing that you may catch on x-ray with an acute knee injury. On the Left-hand side here, and on the right-hand side here, this is the same patient, x-ray versus MR. They had a patellar dislocation. We see an osteochondral fracture. And then on these pictures here, you see an acute ACL injury. On this picture on the left-hand side, you see an OCD lesion. And then on the right-hand side, you just see a little patellar tilt. So I throw that one in there because you may get this in a sunrise view, and it just, again, helps you say, this person's got patellofemoral syndrome. They're having anterior knee pain. This is how we can manage it. And then this is osgood schlatter and SLJ syndrome specific. Uh, so rounding out these vignettes, anterior knee pain on the, the first case, you did physical therapy with them, they get better. Second pain, some sort of intraarticular knee injury, you can give them range of motion exercises and then refer them on, get an x-ray if you have capabilities to do so. The third one, patellar dislocation, you can start them on range of motion exercises that day. And then the fourth one, concern for an OCD, order an x-ray and get an MRI. And if those are positive, definitely send them onward. But if they're negative, you can just treat them as anterior knee pain. So last couple slides here, just more logistical stuff. In terms of referrals, I know people are always concerned, how do we get them in with you fast? We typically have availability within about a week. So certainly if you're ever concerned, I'm always happy to field any emails from you guys and I can help triage and get people in sooner. And then we see all of the things, orthopedics and sports medicine. All right, I ran a little bit over, I apologize, but that is it for me. Well, you must have answered everyone's concerns. So Please introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Beth Salente. I work at Northern Virginia Family Practice. Um, I find that sometimes I see, particularly my older adolescents with sports injuries, turn up in my office from various urgent cares in the dreaded knee immobilizer. Is that something that I should be taking off and getting them doing more range of motion exercises? They're on crutches. Kind of, what do you do in those situations, especially when it's like four or five days out from the injury? Uh, unless you've seen an acute fracture on that, 
or you see somewhere where their knee is just grossly unstable, take the immobilizer, throw it in the trash can, give them a different kind of knee brace. So a short hinge knee brace, an ACE wrap, and then start range of motion exercises. That's awesome. what I do when I see them. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Um, we'll also have a couple minutes for any questions or comments. Uh, right before lunch. So uh, with that, I want to here we go. I want to bring up our next uh, presenters, uh, Dr. Sotulo, Sotulo and uh, Rodriguez. Um, and uh, like it or not, we just have more and more behavioral health, emotional health, mental health concerns bubbling up in our practices. And um, we're already beginning to make good strides about trying to better identify and manage those in our practice setting, but uh, we're early in our journey. And to talk more about that journey, I'm handing it over to Olivia and Nikki. <laughs> oh, the green button here advances things. Wonderful. Can everyone, oh, great, you can hear me, okay. Good morning, welcome. Thank you so much for having us today. Um, my name is Olivia Satulo, and I am a psychologist at Children's National Hospital in the Community Mental Health Corps. And I'm joined today by Nikita Rodriguez, who's also a psychologist at Children's National in Whole Bear Care, which is a very cute name for our Integrated Behavioral Health and Pediatric Primary Care Program. And we are thrilled to be able to talk with you today about integrating behavioral health into your pediatric primary care practice. Um, as you know and have probably heard a lot about, the PHN Behavioral Health Initiative Team, which is generously funded by the Marriott Foundation, has been hard at work over the past year providing our PHN members with different resources related to mental and behavioral health. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that initiative at the end of the presentation today. But for now, Nikita and I really wanted to focus this time on talking to you about what it means to have integrated behavioral health in your pediatric primary care practice. Um, unfortunately, we know it is not as easy as acquiring a behavioral health provider, sticking them within the four walls of your practice, and voila, we have integrated behavioral health. I wish it were so simple. Um, so we're actually going to be spending some time thinking about a new framework that you can use in your practice, whether at the individual provider level or at the organizational level to really enhance how you're approaching behavioral health so that we can meet your patient's needs better. Um, and so with that, I will uh, turn it over to Nikita in just a moment. We have no disclosures um, to go over. And then our objectives, again, are going to be to review those key components of that framework. And then we'll think about practical tools and strategies you can use to make this work in your setting. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to start out likely preaching to the choir because I know you all are well aware of the mental health crisis that we're facing for children and youth um, and adolescents right now. But to just set the frame a little bit, we know that one in five children will have a diagnosable mental health condition over the course of their childhood. And unfortunately, three out of four of those children will not receive the adequate level of support. Um, and what we know is that there are certain children who are at higher risk for developing mental health conditions, and oftentimes those same children face higher barriers to getting connected to the care that they deserve. Um, and while I would love to say that things are getting better, what we have seen over the past few year years are that in a large way, things are getting worse. Um, over the past several years, um, children through the pandemic were faced with periods of isolation. There was increased grief and familial loss, increased awareness of police brutality and social injustice, increased school shootings, and a lot of uncertainty about what was coming in the future. And this has led to a lot of heightened consequences in the mental health realm for our children. Um, parents are noting an increased toll on their children's mental health. Um, children and adolescents are reporting higher symptoms of depression. We're seeing increased hospitalizations and ED usage for mental health conditions. And su suicidality is increasing alarmingly, especially um, we saw that in Black and Asian children over the past few years. 
And so in the kind of uh, wake of all of that, the American Academy of Pediatrics, the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and the Children's Hospital Association came together to talk about how do we address this mental health crisis. And one of the many solutions that they put forward is integrating mental health in primary care. So adding one more thing to the very full list of what you primary care providers need to be doing. And so what you might um, be familiar with is the SAMHSA six levels of integration, which have been talked about at this conference before. But it basically breaks down three types of integrated care from coordinated to co-located to integrated. And so when we think about what those look like, we know that in coordinated care, a PCP is identifying a mental health condition, referring it, referring the family to a com community mental health provider. And then that's kind of it. They may receive a treatment summary, um, maybe provide some information by phone or email to the provider that the family connects to, um, but it's kind of a handoff externally. For co-located care, there is a behavioral health provider located within the medical home, but there's no shared electric, electronic medical record or further consultation, um, and the patient receives the full course of treatment just kind of separate, but maybe right there in the building. And then the last level is that integrated care provider. So um, the, the PCP works alongside a behavioral health provider. They provide impressions and family background. There's a shared medical record system. And that provider triages the patient and bridges care as determined necessary. Disposition and follow-up is shared with the PCP. And there are pros and cons to each of these three levels. So if we think about a case where a family comes back to your clinic after um, or to your practice after being discharged from the ED with an asthma attack, and as you're doing your exam, you identify that they had the asthma attack before they even stepped out on the soccer field. They were um, in the in the locker room thinking about the game and they developed an attack. And you start thinking maybe there's an anxiety component to this. So in a coordinated behavioral health care uh, model, you would say, hey, I think there might be anxiety going on. Why don't you go see this provider? Um, you've addressed their concern. Um, a family who is mental health savvy, who's well resourced, resourced and motivated might take that referral and act on it. Um, but we know that most families don't. About one in four will actually follow up with that external referral. And there are likely disparities in who follows through with that referral. For a co-located behavioral health provider, you again give the referral to somebody who's located in the clinic. Um, the family connects, they, their need is addressed, they receive a full course, um, but you don't really know what went on there. Um, and that co-located provider, if 50% of the patients you're seeing are identifying a behavioral health concern, their caseload is going to fill up really quickly. And so when we move into the integrated behavioral health care space, you provide the referral. Um, and then the important piece is that their care is triaged. And so the, that provider might do a intake and they realize, okay, this kid does have generalized anxiety, but there is a component here of panic that's really interacting with the asthma. And so within this medical home, I'll work with the PCP to think through how do we address panic symptoms and asthma together, redevelop that asthma action plan to address both, and then I'll transition their care elsewhere um, for the longer term anxiety treatment. So it's possible the family might have to navigate both that internal provider and an external provider, but there's more integration of care and that behavioral health provider is not filling their caseload with long-term care patients. Um, again, all of these options have pros and cons, but one of the limitations of this model is that it's highly dependent on whether you have a behavioral health provider and how they practice. And ideally, we would live in a world where we all had behavioral health providers in primary care, but we know that is not the reality for multiple reasons. And so we want to talk through solutions of what we can do as an independent provider, kind of no matter where you are in that level of having access to beha a behavioral health provider. And so we're gonna talk about a different framework in doing that. Great. 
Thank you, Nikita. So that framework that Nikita was just referencing is called the Comprehensive Healthcare Integration Framework, and that's what we're going to spend some time talking with you about today. There's a lot to this model, so we really just want to orient you to it, and we have lots of resources we'll share with you at the end where you can learn more. Um, but this framework was developed by the National Council for Mental Wellbeing in 2022. There's actually an updated version supposed to come out later this year. And what we really like about this particular framework for integrated behavioral health is that it's designed to be applicable to such a wide range of audiences. This uh, framework can work very well for small and large practices, rural and urban practices, even pediatric and adult practices. And interestingly, a behavioral health organization that wants to do more to integrate primary care into to their space can use this, just like a pediatric primary care provider who wants to do more behavioral health work in their space can use this as well. So very bi-directional, um, and it's not contingent on having that integrated behavioral health provider within your practice. The real focus of this framework is on the idea of integratedness, if you will, um, and they define an integrated program or practice by the way that it's organized. So if we have an integrated practice, um, we would be organizing our services so that everyone who's served by the program gets it's a comprehensive array of whatever they need to serve both their mental, behavioral, and physical health needs. And so integratedness is the extent to which programs and practices are organized to deliver care in that way. And it includes both structural components like staffing and processes that are directly experienced by both patients and providers. So this is a little bit of an innovative and newer way to think about integration that goes beyond just do you have an integrated behavioral health provider within the four walls of your practice or not. Um, you may, though, be asking yourself, why do we need a new framework? We had one, and that was perfectly fine. Um, again, some of the benefits that this one has are that it addresses the shortcomings of those other frameworks by looking more holistically at integratedness. It's also very flexible and adaptable, so this is not meant to be totally prescriptive. A lot of these are ideas or ways that you could get started doing this work more. Um, it also includes guidance on measurement of these abstract ideas, which I really appreciate. I know a lot of these things sometimes feel a little bit um, nebulous, and so having some concrete ways to think about these tools can be very helpful. And if this were shared among different groups, it could really give a common language for not only providers, but also payers and policymakers, and ties these key concepts to value, which we know is so important to the pediatric health network. Um, so these are the eight domains of the Comprehensive Healthcare Integration Framework. Um, each of these eight domains are things that uh, are very relevant to integrated behavioral health care. They include things like screening, referral to care, and follow-up, the prevention and treatment of common conditions in the primary care practice, uh, continuing care management, self-management supports, which are things like uh, patient and family handouts, tools, resources on activation and recovery. It does include the multidisciplinary teamwork, so still recognizing that your care team is a very important part of this, how you share treatment, treatment information back and forth, um, but also builds in systematic measurement and quality improvement efforts. There's also space in here for linking families to community and social services to meet needs related to social determinants of health, which we know is a very important part of the behavioral health system. And it does not overlook financial sustainability, which we know is of big importance to our private practice providers. So the framework is designed with these eight uh, different domains, if you will, and then we use um, some constructs or levels, as I like to think of them, to conceptualize where you might fall in each domain on this kind of continuum from historical practice to greater integration. So I know there's a lot of information here. Again, just want to orient you a little bit to how this model is set up. So we would think that if you have not done anything related to a behavioral health domain, your practice is probably in the historical practice setting. Um, and that means that we're focused on interventions and practices at the individual level. Um, we're really kind of focusing all of our efforts there. As we move up to care management and consultation, we're thinking more about serving programs and teams and cohorts of patients. And then the final level, comprehensive treatment and population management, is really about the organization level uh, change um, in serving actual whole populations of, um, of patients. And so these uh, levels are also successive. They build on one another. So we wouldn't think that you could jump all the way from historical practice to level three without going through levels one and two first.
And so this is the, um, the actual framework itself on the left there. These are some nice tools that you can use in your own practice to assess your level of behavioral health integratedness. And the way this is set up is we have the domain on the left, and then the examples of what it would look like to be in each of the levels are described in more detail on the right. So you could simply go through here, check off which one of these boxes sounds like you, and then also think about where would you like to be in your practice, both as an individual provider and at the organizational level. Um, the AAP also has a great mental health practice readiness inventory that has um, more tools where you can go through and check off some different questions around what are your strengths and areas for practice change. All right, so I will hand it over to Nikita to talk us through a case example, applying this framework at the individual provider level. Um, and I'll note that we do have some color coding here. So when you see the green throughout, those are online free resources that we'll link to at the end that you can access. Orange will link to that CHI framework I just mentioned. And then red on later slides are resources that we have available through the PHN Behavioral Health Initiative. All right, so if we imagine um, a primary care provider practicing in that historical practice level, Imagine uh, Dr. Z seeing a 15-year-old female who presents to practice as a new patient. The patient seems somewhat aloof and irritable. Dr. Z asks about her mood, and she says she's fine while yawning. There are no major medical concerns, and she needs a school form completed. There isn't any protocol in place at the practice to do anything additional, so Dr. Z completes her form but suspects there must be more to the story. Dr. Z lets her know they are available if she ever wants to talk more. So some of you might hear this story and think, yes, that's how I practice. I imagine a lot of you might be a little bit further along than that historical practice. But what I also imagine is everybody can resonate with that experience of seeing a patient and feeling like, ooh, there's something I missed there. I've been practicing in primary care for a long time went to school to study mental health for a long time. And I still have those patients where I'm like, oh gosh, I just, there was something going on and I didn't catch it. And so one of the great things about the framework that Olivia just talked about is that self-assessment. So Dr. Z is like, I don't like this feeling. Let me see what I can do about it. And they go and complete the IBH self-assessment from the National Council website and the AAP website. And when they do the self-assessment, they kind of mark off where they are. They're in that historical practice in several different domains, and they decide um, to improve in domains one, two, four, and seven. And we'll go into more details about what those are. Um, again, I understand how many things you're asked to do in primary care. And so improving in all four domains might not be realistic for your practice, but a lot of these things are small steps that we can take forward. And you can choose one that you might want to, to kind of prioritize for the time being. So Dr. Z decides to address all four because she's an overachiever and she goes back in time and sees the patient again. So in domain one, screening referral to care and follow-up. Now as part of routine care, Dr. Z screens the 15-year-old fem female for depression at the well visit using an evidence-based screener, the PHQ-9 modified for teens, which she heard about at the PHN BHI depression webinar. The patient scores a 14, but denies the suicidality item. So that puts them in the moderate range. Um, Dr. Z makes a referral to an outside behavioral health provider because um, her practice hasn't jumped all the way to having an integrated provider. So she looks at dchealthcheck.net to get some uh, resource lists. Sorry, I'm struggling with this thing. There we go. In domain two, prevention and treatment of common conditions. Dr. Z goes to the VMAP depression care guide, which is linked on the PHNBHI website, um, which they learned about in the webinar, and follows the flowchart in session. Based on this flowchart, she learns that she can do an intervention on pleasant activity scheduling um, using the AAP common elements approach and mental health strategies that were discussed in the webinar in the office hours. Dr. Z sees the patient again, and with talking with the patient a little bit more and doing some of the screening that was described, she learns that the patient previously had a Zoloft prescription but ran out a month ago. Dr. Z isn't totally comfortable reinitiating that prescription, so she calls the Mental Health Access Program, three different options depending on whether you're in Virginia, Maryland, or DC, and gets a free telephone consultation that builds her confidence in getting that prescription reinstated. 
Finally, in domains four and seven for self-management support, um, Dr. Z shares some patient educational materials about depression, including skills for healthy coping, which are linked in the PH PHN BHI website. And then family endorsed some food insecurity when she did a screening for social determinants of health. And so she uses findhelp.org to share a list of resources with the family in the follow-up visit. Again, we understand this is a lot of things, but there might be one or two places where you can leave feeling like, okay, I dressed a little bit more and hopefully um, offset some of those uncomfortable feelings when you don't, when you know there's something going on in the mental health domain and we've missed it. Great. And so now also want to think through just briefly, what would this look like at the next level up? Let's say we've done all of those things and now we're in a practice that's really at that care management and consultation level. And we have an integrated behavioral health provider in that practice. How might this case look a little bit different? So now we're looking at multidisciplinary teamwork, domain five. And while the PCP was titrating that Zoloft, the integrated behavioral health provider would also be checking in with the patient at visits and using skills like motivational interviewing to promote medication adherence. At those integrated follow-up visits, that integrated behavioral health provider would be reinforcing the behavioral activation skills and tracking response to intervention using screeners from our PHNBHI resource uh, library on the website. Then um, the IBH provider would be closing the loop with the PCP after those visits. Maybe they're sharing new insights that the pediatrician didn't have before, things like possible medication side effects or how the patient is now motivated to really complete their treatment. And that integrated behavioral health provider used our MHTTC integrated primary care guide available on the websites as well to help establish what their parameters would be for their IBH practice. And they share that education with their staff so that everyone knows how to use their services appropriately. And then finally, as a last piece of this example, the systematic measurement and quality improvement domain at the practice level, Dr. Z's office is also regularly reviewing their depression screening and follow-up measures in Arcadia so that they can track population screening rates over time. They participated in the PHN race data collection initiative to reduce rates of patients who need their racial data updated in the EHR. And this allows for them to assess potential disparities um, in screening, which is something that comes in at this later level. And their practice is also participating in the PHN and BHIQI project to make systematic changes to increase their overall levels of integratedness, which is what led to them hiring that integrated behavioral health provider who saw the 15-year-old in the first place. So again, we just wanted to give you a little bit of a snapshot of how this framework could be practically applied to your practice, whether you're at the individual provider level or thinking about practice change for your entire organization. So some takeaways we'd like to share. Um, first, we do feel that behavioral health is really a key component of overall health. This is not something that can be siloed off or put off um, in, into another setting. We know this is something that primary care providers are dealing with all the time, and it needs to be addressed. And we also feel that everyone can take action to improve how you're addressing behavioral health in your practice. There are so many resources out now to make this accessible and successful. So one small step that anyone could take could be to use these self assessment tools to figure out what is that right level of integratedness for you in your setting. Again, this framework really brings value to each of these levels. It doesn't say that we have to wait until we have an integrated behavioral health provider to be doing behavioral health care well or to be demonstrating value. We can demonstrate value even without those providers in our practice. And starting small and working from where you are is a great way to try to achieve uh, change and positive outcomes for your patients. So this is the list of resources. These are all hyperlinks. So when the slides are posted online, you'll be able to click and get to any of these resources that we talked about today. And then I'd like to take just a moment to share briefly about our behavioral health initiative um, in earnest. So you have probably seen this before, but the purpose of this behavioral health initiative through PHN is to develop a comprehensive strategy to address mental and behavioral health needs within the regional PHN network, recognizing there is not a one-size-fits-all approach that's going to work for everyone. We've been really focused on two key areas, education, training, and partnerships, and integrated business models and care management to help meet this goal. 
And we have two exciting opportunities that are available for you to participate in now. Um, so you heard a little bit about our webinars, office hours, and provider website. Um, the webinars and office hours are free. They are virtual, and they're held on a monthly basis. They're led by our experts in child and adolescent psychiatry and psychology. Our webinars have covered topics like ADHD, anxiety, depression, and eating disorders. A lot of that content is at the intermediate or 2.0 level, but all of the webinars are recorded, and they're posted online. And our 1.0 content from last year is also posted online that you can access. Um, we have three office hours coming up in June, July, and August. And I will say, even if you don't have case questions, even if you don't have things that you want to discuss, our presenters come prepared with lots of content and information to share. So you are welcome to come and listen, absorb, even if you don't have specific case questions. But if you do have things you'd like to ask our providers about, this is a great opportunity for that. And then we're also very excited um, to be working uh, with practices building their integrated behavioral health infrastructure. We launched our QI project in January with a pilot cohort of practices. And we are so thrilled to be able to expand to um, recruit a second cohort to participate. Um, so if you are interested in that, you can apply now through June 7th. Um, this cohort is for uh, PHM practices who are participating in value-based care contracts and will run from this July into next June. So if you're interested in doing more about integrated behavioral health, if any of this sounded exciting to you, this is a great opportunity to get free consultation, technical assistance, hands-on support, and earn some MOC credit while you're at it um, with our PHM BHI team. We'd like to say a huge thank you to the rest of our team. This work would not be possible without all of the fantastic individuals who are listed here and many more. And then these are QR codes where you can go to um, access our resources. So if you want to check out our BHI website um, with resources and training registrations, that's the top QR code. And then if you're interested in the QR, uh, QI project and would like to apply, that'll be the second QR code. And you're welcome to contact myself or Nikita with any questions. Thank you so much for your time today. Have time for one or two questions. Great, you guys. <laughs> yeah, and you must have answered everything. So uh, that is good. Um, um, we're almost at our lunch break. Before that, uh, we want to spend a minute or two um, chatting a little bit about sort of the overall theme for some of the work that uh, we're presenting today, which is really about collaborative care models, not simply send your referrals to the hospital, but how do we learn here about what we can better do in primary care practice, uh, as well as collaborate with specialists to sort of help raise all boats uh, to help facilitate that conversation. I'm thrilled to bring up uh, Dr. Ed Fox. Um, uh, Ed uh, uh, spent uh, many years in busy primary care pediatric practice in Northern Virginia. He's now one of our medical directors um, and uh, brings all the right perspective and focus to the work that we are doing uh, in our pediatric health network. So Ed, I'm gonna turn it over to you to ask a few questions. That was good, great to be here. Thank you all for coming. Uh, the, so initially we were like, okay, we're going to have these back-to-back -back sessions. There's not really a whole lot of time for questions and answers. Maybe we should build in a pause. And so we built in a pause into both the morning and afternoon. Uh, the pause right now is between you and lunch. I got that. But, uh, and so, but there's a lot of content, uh, the an FOP we were treating as, uh, sort of taking advantage that FOP was happening and having this sort of wider conversation around collaborative care and collaborative management. Uh, there are many folks in the audience that have lots of experience in co-management. Uh, whatever we call this, collaborative care, care coordination, uh, there's many different terms. There's also many uh, applications. So is collaborative care, the work we do with our ED colleagues in managing the kids who go to the ED and get discharged back out to us and how are we managing their care? How are we communicating with the ED? How are we doing that with our inpatient colleagues? And when our kids are getting admitted to the hospital, 
most of us do no longer round on our patients when they're inpatients. And so how do we how do we coordinate better with uh, with the hospital systems in our area and making sure that our, our kids get better care? And thankfully, we are finally, I believe, at a point as a network. Oh, where's the? Oh, thank you. Um, so I think we're at a point as a network where we have much better available data to start making some of these decisions and developing some strategies as a group. Um, we certainly do not have all the answers. Uh, we need a lot of input from everybody in the room. And I'd like to recognize how many different folks across our practices are involved in this work. And so today was really an effort to look at some of the more common clinical conditions that are referred to specialists. And we didn't pull these out of a hat. We actually looked at you know, some of the data that's available across uh, Children's National and the specialists and what diagnoses they're making. And the conditions we're hearing about today were specifically uh, those conditions. We would love to develop much more functionality. And Dr. Holly and Kim was referring to this, like how do we build some of these guidelines and algorithms into our EMRs? How do we capture the data uh, to sort of better represent like what kids are coming in for, what we're doing with them, what kind of impact uh, are we having in their care? What works better than other things? Um, I loved hearing, for example, this morning, like go to Maxall. That's the one that's already approved. You're not, you're not gonna need to, get, need to get a prior authorization, right? So that kind of useful, very practical information is the goal. Um, and we would love for you all to give us a lot more feedback around what things would work for you. Right. And if you already have a great relationship with, I don't know, the allergist that's, you know, two floors up from you, and you've developed a really effective co-management strategy for getting kids into allergy shots and then you do the rest of their care, we'd love to hear that. Right. Because we feel like that experience could certainly be uh, disseminated throughout the entire network for us to use. And so this image is just an image here so that we wouldn't have to stare at my picture. Uh, the uh, is really sort of on the expanded medical home. And we're looking at the pillars of primary care and specialty care. And then the bars represent areas where we all recognize we could do a lot better, right? And so there are efforts across, across all of these. Uh, and so please uh, reach out, let us know what's working for you. How do you feel like we should do a better job communicating? Um, when I go to my, the meetings with all the specialists, what, what I hear from them is, well, you know, the kids show up and we don't know anything about them. We have no idea what the question is. We don't know what you want to, like, what exactly do you want us to address? We have no history, you know? And so it's funny because we all feel like we're filling out all that information on the referral stuff and somehow never, not surprisingly, does not get across. And so really trying to sort of tease out what's happening at that granular level and trying to improve those processes so that hopefully it could, um, it could improve the the care of the kids and their and their outcomes. And so we're gonna have a similar session this afternoon. Um, obviously, I won't have to introduce introduce this concept, but maybe what we can do as we prepare for the session this afternoon is for you all to think through some examples of things you all have done and have been doing uh, in a collaborative management or collaborative care um, spirit with any of the specialists that you work with. And then perhaps also the the other two other things I would love for you all to think about a little bit is what have what has been effective for you all in communicating with specialists. So we'd love to hear more about what works. I think we are all pretty aware of what doesn't work. Uh, so maybe spending a little more time and sharing some um, positive outcomes and some communication strategies you've developed in working with colleagues. And then the other piece is um, we're talking a lot about developing algorithms and and best practices and making sure we disseminate those, like what would be most helpful for you all as far as accessing those, right? Because I sort of feel like we can go home with our sheets of paper or our slides, but then when we're seeing that kid with a headache, you know, tomorrow morning, we're like, what did they say exactly? You know, and so, um, so just thinking through what would be most useful if you all are using websites that you do find super useful because it is, um, really easy to find and really easy to use, then we don't need to reinvent the wheel. I think we can do a lot of that um, a lot of that work here. And I would like to recognize our behavioral health colleagues because they've done an amazing job. So when you go to our PHN website, uh, we have focused on those conditions first. And so when you go there, 
you'll find a ton of resources. Um, give us some feedback. Is this something we should also do with like the constipation work that we're doing and the work we're doing on headaches? And I can expand on uh, the work we are doing with those two. There's about five to seven practices involved in some pilot programs, one for constipation, one for headaches. And this afternoon, we'll hear about the constipation one a little bit. We already heard about the headache one this morning. And so we're going to be doing some of that work for some other conditions. And we would love for uh, many of you to participate in that work. And so if you have specific things you would like us to address that you do not feel like we're talking about, uh, please let me know. I can think of one immediately, uh, sleep disordered breathing and snoring. You know, when I look at the ENT data, we are referring a lot of those kids to ENT. Some of them go to pulmonary, some get sleep studies, some don't. Like, what should we be doing with these kids? And, you know, can we agree on what some some of those best practices? So just an example, I'm sure each of you can think of many more. So uh, open, happy to open it up. Also happy to let everybody go to lunch. And then maybe we can use the afternoon session for having more of a conversation about that. Any questions or comments? Are people hungry? Good. Well, I want to uh, thank Dr. Fox. Our goal is not to have this be a one and done CME program. We are all so busy. We are all struggling to keep our heads above water, uh, both clinically and financially. Uh, we're busy, um, but uh, we simply can't refer everything. I know that's not what the hospital wants to hear, but in reality, we've got to be able to think across the continuum of care and figure out how to better manage what can be managed in our primary care settings, as well as what does need to be better managed by the specialists, but also think not simply about sending kids back and forth, but about how do we collaborate on care and just as important, include the child and family as partners in that planning. Uh, because it's not simply trading between the clinicians, it is really engaging the families, which cuts down on a whole lot of questions, phone calls, people calling the right, if you have the right game plan in place and families know who they need to call for what, it cuts down on a lot of the uh, noise and exasperation or those sorts of things. Ooh, Dr. Fox has one more thing to say. So I'm going to put her on the spot, but I did want to recognize a lot of the work that went on before some of us got here. So Dr. Ellie Hamburger is sitting in the audience. I'd like to appreciate her help in starting a lot of this co-magic uh, information. One of our heroes. All right. Um, we are going to break for lunch. Um, Lunch is being served in two locations. There's a table out in the hallway here, and there's a set of tables in the exhibit hall. It's the same food. So find the, find the station that works well for you. Um, uh, if you want to sit and eat, bring your, your plates back here to this room. This is the room where we will eat. Uh, we're giving you a couple minutes to really chill, decompress, um, and we will start up again at 1245. So thank you all for participating this morning. Looking forward to a great afternoon.